Hi, and welcome to lesson seven. So far, you've learned some basic Swift code and how to organize that code into executable blocks called functions. Well, in this video, you're going to learn how to organize and group your functions into what's known as classes. Now, before we go on, I just wanna say one thing, and that is that learning something new is hard. Seriously, I know firsthand because I failed at learning iOS programming when I first started. So give yourself a pat on the back for coming this far, especially if you've never coded before. Now I know you might be asking yourself, constants, variables, functions, why the heck do I need to know any of this? Well, I can guarantee you that after this lesson and into the next, all the pieces are going to start to fall into place for you because we're gonna move back to our Xcode project and I'm gonna point out all the different pieces that you've been learning about in the last three lessons and you're gonna have a eureka moment. You're gonna see that Xcode project in a different light. So I want you to pay extra careful attention in this lesson because it's the last one before we move back to our work hard game Xcode project. All right, let's do this. So on the screen, I've got two functions right now. Uh, they don't really do anything, but one is called cruise and one is called thrust. So let me explain why. Imagine yourself as an engineer for NASA, and you're writing the code to power one of their rockets. Now, all of the code for cruising, you would put inside the cruise function, and all of the code that are gonna turn on the rocket thrusters, you're gonna put inside the thrust function. Now, just like how you organize that code into those functions, you can further organize these two functions into a class, because potentially you could have many, many functions, right? So a class, you can use it, to group together functions that kind of serve the same purpose or the same goal. So let me show you how to declare a class first of all. Use the class keyword, and then you would give the class a name. So I'm gonna call this uh, rocket, no, I'm gonna call it spaceship, just because I like that word a little more. Now you open up a pair of curly brackets, and I am going to put some space inside the curly brackets, and I'm going to highlight these two functions. I'm gonna press Command X to cut them, and I'm going to press Command V in there to paste it. So what we have now is kind of like three levels of organization, right? At the top level, we have the spaceship class. Inside the spaceship class, we have two functions, cruise and thrust, and inside each of those functions, we have the code to uh, essentially carry out those uh, abilities. Now, there's one distinction I want to make, and that is that when you move the function into a class, those functions are now called a method of that class. So I know it's a little confusing because nothing's changed except what you call them, right? When, when there's a standalone thing, they're called functions, but when you put these functions inside a class, they are now called methods of that class. But it's sort of interchangeable if you say, you know, the cruise function of the spaceship class, people will still understand what you're saying, but I just want you to know that the correct uh, terminology is that cruise is a method of spaceship. All right, just a little distinction there. Let's illustrate this in a diagram. First we had functions, and then we put them inside of a class, and now they're called methods. I wanna talk about variable scope for a second. In the last lesson, you learned that declaring a variable inside of a function, it only exists within that function's scope. So for instance, if we declared a variable called name in function A, we can't access that name variable in function B because function B has its own scope. The same goes for the reverse. If we declare a variable in function B, we can't access it in function A because that variable would only exist in function B's scope. Now get this, the class itself has its own class scope. You can actually declare a variable inside the class but sits outside of any particular function. Now this variable exists inside the entire scope of this class. Since function A and function B are also inside the scope of this class, they can actually access that variable. Finally, here's the kicker. When you declare a variable inside the class, but it's outside of any functions, like what we've done here, it's actually called a property of that class. Now let's see this in action. So let's go ahead and declare a property of our spaceship here. Now it's going to be inside of the class, right? That's the starting curly bracket, but it's going to be outside of any of these two functions. So I'm gonna put it up here. I'm gonna call it 
a fuel level and I'm going to assign 100 to it. Now this fuel level property is inside the scope of the class, just like how these two functions are also inside the scope of the class. So I can actually access the fuel level property from here. See, I can print it out. Now it's not going to actually print anything because uh, we need to execute these functions and we're gonna do that a little later on. But just from the fact that, um, actually, you know, let me run it just to show you that the playground isn't going to throw any sort of errors, right? So it can access this property. However, let me declare a variable in here. Let's just say var test is equal to true and make it a Boolean, right? Um, this variable, because it's declared within the cruise function, it only exists inside the scope of that function, you know, that little bubble. So I cannot access it from here let's say print test and you're going to see that Xcode is going to throw an error. Let's run that. So it's saying that it cannot find test because it only exists within this scope. So now let's go ahead and erase this test code here. And like I said before, if this scope thing is a little bit confusing, it's going to come with time. I promise you that as you're gonna write more code, you're gonna understand this stuff a lot more. There's gonna come a point where these things suddenly just like click for you. All right, now we're gonna take a giant leap and I'll explain to you how classes are used. Now it's going to require a little bit of abstract thinking. I also wanna add that in my six years of teaching iOS app development, this is the single hardest concept to understand for beginners who have never coded before. But once you understand this, then you will have crossed the biggest hump that so many people give up at. All right, I'm done talking, let's do this. Now let's use the same analogies we used before. Suppose we have some data and we have variables and constants as sticky tabs. Now we have functions that encapsulate these pieces of code. And let's say that functions are like file folders. Now we have classes that contain a bunch of functions and variables. And let's say that class is a file box that contains file folders. Well, at the end of the day, what we have is just a file box full of instructions. It doesn't actually do anything. Some people say, let's think of the class like a recipe. Some people say, let's think of the class like a blueprint. So what's the common thing here? They all need someone or something to turn the set of instructions into action. Someone to take those recipes and turn it into a cake or someone to take the blueprints and build a rocket ship. Now this rocket will work exactly like it was designed to. It can thrust and it can cruise because we've given it functions to do so. But understand that that class doesn't thrust or cruise. It's the actual object that gets created from the class that will thrust or cruise. Furthermore, once you have a blueprint, you can make multiple spaceships. Each of them will have its own fuel level and ability to thrust or cruise. The blueprint is called a class and the objects that are created are called objects or instances of the spaceship class. All right, so who is the person that will take that class and turn it into an object? Well, that's the device in your hand. It's a mini computer. You write your instructions in Xcode. Xcode will turn it into a format that can be understood by your device and your device carries out those instructions. So here's the tricky part. You need to write instructions to tell the computer to take your classes and to turn them into objects. And furthermore, you need to write instructions to tell the computer how you want it to use those objects. For example, you write instructions like, when the user taps the lift off button, then you create an object from the spaceship class, then call the thrust function of that object, then call the cruise function of that object. You know, that could be an app right there. Now let's go back to our playground and see how you can write instructions like this. All right, so you just learned that a class with its properties and methods, they don't actually do anything until you bring it to life by turning it into an object or an instance of that class. So essentially, when you're writing this code, in organizing your code into functions and organizing your functions into classes, you're really designing something, right? You're programming something to be turned into an object to be used. So before we create a spaceship object from this class, I wanna first add another property and some code to the cruise and thrust functions so that they actually do something. So up here, right below this property, I'm going to declare another name property and I'm going to assign it an empty string. So you can actually do that. It's a string, but with nothing inside. But essentially, it sets the data type for this name property. 
And inside the cruise function here, uh, essentially I want to print out a statement, but I want to include the name. So I'm going to say uh, cruising is initiated for, and then I'm going to insert the name. Remember how we do this? You learned about this a couple lessons ago, I believe, or last lesson. Uh, backslash and then rounded brackets, and you put it in the variable name, and it's going to insert that into the string. So we're going to do thrust as well. So we're going to say is, let's say, rocket thrusters uh, initiated for name. All right, so now we can bring this spaceship class to life by creating a spaceship object from it. Or in other words, an instance of the spaceship class. And the way we do that is we basically type in the name of the class followed by two rounded brackets. So let's start doing that. And you'll notice that autocomplete uh, shows us. So you just press enter and then you can go ahead and put two rounded brackets like that. Now that kind of looks like a function call, right? And just like a function call with a return value, how it returns something to you and you need to capture it using a variable or a constant, the same thing is happening right here. By writing this line of code, you're creating a new spaceship object and it's being returned to you. So you need to keep track of that data using a constant or a variable. We're gonna use a variable because I wanna show you um, how we're gonna try assigning something else to this variable. All right, anyways, I'm gonna call it my ship and it's going to keep track of that spaceship object that we just created. I wanna show you something interesting. Why don't we try assigning another type of data to my ship? For example, an integer, 10. Well, you'll see that we can't assign an integer to this variable because this variable is of the data type spaceship. Well, what do you mean? We went through some data types in lesson five. Remember string, bool, in, float, double? Well, as it turns out, when you create a new class, this is now a custom data type. So spaceship is actually a data type. So what you've done here with this line is that you've said, my ship is a variable that can only keep track of uh, data that is of the spaceship data type. So essentially, that's what's really happening here. You're declaring a my ship variable that is gonna keep track of spaceship data types and you're assigning a new object to this variable. So I just wanted you to know that so that it doesn't get confusing otherwise. Now the next thing I want to show you is how do we access the properties and the methods of the newly created spaceship object? Well, we have a reference to that newly created spaceship object from this variable, my ship. And if you've never heard of that terminology before, a reference is essentially what your variable or constant is. It's uh, keeping a reference or keeping track of the, a piece of data, which in this case is the spaceship object. So uh, my ship is a reference to that spaceship object. All right, so all we do is we type in your variable name or your constant name or you know whatever has the reference to that object. Press dot, and this is called dot notation. This is how we are going to access the methods and properties of that object. As you can see, autocomplete pops at this menu and we can, you know, we can access the name, the fuel level, the cruise and the thrust functions. And you know, when you get more advanced with Swift, there are actually ways to restrict uh, what can be accessed, but that's um, for, the, for later, for the future. For now, I want to set its name. So I'm going to call, um, I'm going to access the name property and I can actually say that this name property should keep track of a new piece of data. I'm going to call this ship Tom. All right, so I'm assigning the string Tom to the property name for that object, my ship. And next, I'm going to call, using dot notation, the cruise function. And when I run this code, you can see cruising is initiated for Tom. But had I not set this line, remember I'm gonna use a comment here, we talked about comments in lesson five, 
that essentially turns this line of code off and treats it as a note or a remark. So I'm going to turn that line off and then I'm going to run the code again. And you can see cruising is initiated for empty string, nothing. Okay, so that's kind of cool. We could also call my ship dot thrust and we can run that. And you can see there it goes. I can also just access the properties. I don't have to be assigning things to it. So for example, uh, let's erase these two lines and let's say, uh, let's print out my ship dot name and let's print out my ship dot fuel level. So let's run that. You can see it's Tom and 100. I like to think that coding an app is like writing a script for a movie. The movie script is your app code. The character roles are the classes that you've designed, but character roles themselves don't do anything. These roles need to be turned into physical actors and actresses, just like we need to turn classes into objects. Then the actors and actresses follow the script to perform your movie, just like how your objects work together to make your app function. So all of this stuff is pretty abstract, but in the next lesson, we're going to put it into practice. But first, let's do a quick recap of what we learned in this lesson because it was quite a bit. Now, classes contain methods and properties. And remember, methods are just another name for functions. You also learn that classes by themselves don't do anything. They need to be turned into objects first. These objects are also referred to as instances of that class. So remember, a class is kind of like a blueprint and the object is what's created from that blueprint. You learned how to create a new instance of a class and you also learned about dot notation, which is used to access the methods and properties of that object. Now, if you need to, I recommend to rewatch this video and ask any questions you have in the discussion area below. I also have a worksheet for you to practice and to solidify these concepts in your head. And if things are still a little fuzzy and it's completely normal if they are, I highly recommend for you to download this worksheet and go through it. Now, in the next lesson, we're going to use your newly minted Swift skills to bring the war card game to life. Now, if you're excited about that, like I am, type in I'm pumped into the discussion area below. Now, if you like this video, please hit that subscribe button down below and click on that bell notification icon if you don't want to miss the next lesson. All right, so click on the lesson eight thumbnail and I'll see you there.